Welcome to Writer to Writer, a program about writers, with writers, for writers, teaching us, of course, the fine art of writing. And with us today, someone who is just, I'm very curious about, someone who does something that I'm very curious about, Frederick Park. You're a storyteller. And in a sense, all of us are storytellers, just some of us are much better than others. And um, you know, when I thought about doing this interview, I thought, well, where do we start? Well, I guess we have to start at the beginning, don't we? How did you become a storyteller? Well, the uh, ability to hear and remember jokes fell to me. It was my lot in elementary school. My compatriots, as the years rolled by, would be trying to remember some little bit of something that had passed through our lives. And if there was a glitch just prior to the punchline, in anticipation of getting it right, if the memory didn't come, more than once people would say, wait here, and they would come find me, and they go, how's that go? <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, right. Well, I'd tell them, and then I'd go back, and they'd get to laugh. So that's what jokes are. They're just little tiny, I think about jokes as, uh, and I have to say this about jokes, I have to sort of start there, because that's really sort of how I came to storytelling. My father read to us and told us stories about his own youth when I was a child. But jokes are little presents from the hip pocket of the mind to be delivered over to anyone to whom you could give the gift of a smile or maybe a belly laugh and maybe tears running down their face. Eh? So jokes were part of the fabric of my life always, right up to now. And they all fall into two categories. They serve all kinds of purposes, jokes do. More often than not, as soon as something hits the news, there's a joke on email about it. You know, It serves the purpose of letting us react to stuff that is sort of so far out there sometimes that it's scary or maybe stuff that's on some line uh, difficult for us to relate to. So having said that about jokes and letting it go at that, jokes are small. They fit real well. But stories are longer than jokes unless they happen to be the kind of joke that you can elaborate on the shaggy dog yeah, story, I was say, shaggy dog you know, is really a joke, mm -hmm. but it's just long enough, and because it is purely a joke, it is totally boring as a story once you realize you're being reeled in, unless it's really well done. And then, so that sort of bridges the gap between jokes and stories, the shaggy dog tale. But, uh, and I'm speaking now about an oral literature. Yeah. This is uh, something that we all are constantly uh, exposed to in these days of media. If you speak to people that are working in film schools now, they'll tell you that they can produce people who know the techno, the pyrotechnics of everything that can be done in the filmmaking world, but God, they cannot write a script. Because people that are young have been inundated with artificial storylines. That's right. To the extent that the realities of telling stories, even as fundamental as reading from the Bible, this great old story, suddenly people are taking their stories and what stories lend, and that is the weight of learning Goodness gracious, if the weight of learning is cast as a responsibility onto the media, they haven't taken it seriously yet. But these are the stories that people are exposed to. And even if it's people relating in, in somewhat uh, real fashion, though it's a stage thing, when we were children, what was on television was known to be a parody of life. 
And there are two generations in the world now in America who don't see it as a parody of life, but see it as life. It's scary, isn't it? It is. So. So how did you become a storyteller? After working for myself in the plant world, running orchards, uh, gardening, uh, my father had apprenticed me to uh, a powerfully dynamic gardener and a botanist and a biologist when I was a child. And this man had taught me how to graft and prune. So this was my life, and I figured this is what I'm going to do. And, and I ran f some f different farms for different people, you know, looking for ways to sort of be my own boss. I really liked that. And I met a man uh, in Kentucky who said to me, look, you are from the mountains. And in Appalachia, which is one of the great bastions of isolation, like Louisiana, in Appalachia, it's the mountains that caused isolation. Roads didn't come until the turn of the century. In Louisiana, it was the heat. But he says, we need people to speak for this region. We don't need outsiders to come here and study us and scrutinize us and tell the world about Appalachia. But this place that has preserved a culture in the throes of two centuries of growth, just by isolation more than anything, needs its own native sons and daughters to understand what it is that makes us a whole place. And when he was speaking about that, he was speaking about the mountains as an idea that transcends the boundaries of states and counties. So Appalachia is an idea that is alive and well, but privately so. And so I thought, well, I want to go to college. And so I'd been to college a few times and never stayed for long. Studied all kinds of stuff and always changed gears. So I, I designed, again, sort of wanting to do my own thing. I designed a program in Appalachian Studies. And I worked for a little more than a year at Berea College in Eastern Kentucky. And this man is Loyal Jones that I refer to. He was the director of the Appalachian Center. And rather than sort of school me in the fashion of academics, he simply called me into his office when there were people who were in his office who were great storytellers. And they became friends of mine because I knew jokes and they knew jokes and Loyal Jones knew I knew jokes. <laughs> and so we traded jokes. Cradus Williams, a man who was the head of the English department at Appalachian State and was forced against his will to be the chancellor when the chancellor died. And he did it for a little while, and he stepped down. Uh, great, great man, born and raised in eastern Kentucky. Leonard Roberts, who went to Columbia University in the UK and was offered jobs all over this country. And he said, no, I'm going to go to Pikeville. I'm going to go to the place where I'm from. I'm a McCoy. He was a McCoy by blood. And one of his books, I will talk about Leonard Roberts uh, perhaps a little bit more, a very important man in my life, but a collector like Richard Chase, who also came there. And I toured around, drove Richard Chase around and helped him because he was going blind. He needed a driver, somebody to sort of... Uh, so the storytellers who are tied to the oral tradition were in my face. I had to escort them at the wishes of my boss because I wound up working in the Appalachian Center at this college. And I had to catalog all these tapes of storytelling and music and God knows what folklore was there. It is a wonderful collection. So I really took it to heart. I just, it is like Cecil Sharp, who was an anthropologist and a folklorist and a collector of dance and song in England. The First World War came, he came to this country to live, and he was looking for folk songs, like James Francis Child of the Child Ballads had done. And Child was a collector in England from literary sources, and this guy Cecil Sharp was looking for the real tunes. He knew they must exist. 
And when he came to Appalachia and started really collecting and just going crazy with what he was finding, loving it, he wrote about this stuff. He says, this folk material only needs to be known in order to be loved. And he was speaking about folk material, not just that which he was finding in Appalachia. Well, we're, so, we're talking about history, really. And we really are. Cultural I history. I got sucked into it. I couldn't help because you, it is true. It's, it's cultural history of, of a high... I realized that Loyal Jones had forced me to see myself as a link in an ancient chain. So if Leonard Roberts and Richard Chase and Cradis Williams and, and Betty Smith and Gene Ritchie and dozens of other people in my region had been exposed to stories that had never come from a book, that old story came along with a way of presenting it. And both the story and the way of presenting the story have nothing to do with performance. What do they have to do with? They have to do with something like you and I sitting across from each other and perhaps a fireplace right there and me telling a story. And if you were my wife or if you were my daughter, you would goad me to tell you your favorite story because it never gets old and it's never the same. So there is a backbone in oral tradition. Think about Homer. The Iliad and the Odyssey are two frozen pieces of literature and yet he was a storyteller. And those stories that are in print for us to examine are one single version of stories that he must have told hundreds of times each year. And when you look at the stories, you can see that there are these little movable parts that could easily be shifted from here to there. So if you're telling about blood and guts and your audience is just really not wanting to hear it, well, you could sort of lean on the love aspect, maybe, or just shift the story around to keep your audience, because it is this that is where the story lives. So in, in, in the old way of telling stories, when an audience is nothing more than the people that are sitting within earshot in the room, there is a, a way of telling that doesn't translate onto a stage. It is a different thing. It's something that you make together, the listener and the teller, because... That is I, so. Am I, that is so. Because you may move the pieces depending on how the listener responds. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us a story now, please? Yes. I will tell you a wee little story. Okay. <laughs> There are many children in my family. The boys are all at the upper end of the family and the girls are all at the lower end of the family. This is a story of how I came to be in the world. The roof with seven boys and seven girls <laughs> had uh, so many additions as the need for bedroom space arose an addition went on the house it wasn't always it was it was always whatever was available so some of it was asphalt shingles, some of it was tin, some of it was rolled roof, and some of it was just tar paper. And it leaked. And wherever it leaked inside wasn't necessarily where it was leaking outside. And rather than redo the whole roof, about once a year, my dad got all the boys 
and he'd put them up on the roof and he'd have them scratching away the flashing around the chimney and all the seams of all the various patchwork pieces that had made up over the years the roof of the house. Well, all the least little ones were playing around on the porch, you see. And he had them up there working pretty good and he decided it was time to get the blackjack and he'd already bought it and hauled it up the mountain. And so he strolled down to the shed and got the wheelbarrow and filled it up with these five-gallon cans of roofing cement. Great old screwdriver sticking out of his back pocket, I'm sure, and he set it down right off the end of the porch. And he took the screwdriver and he loosened them all, and took the lids off of all of them, and grabbed two and walked up the ladder with these two five-gallon buckets of tar. He got him up on the roof and had hardly set him down. And he heard a loud bang and a scream. And he knew that one of the little ones had fallen off the porch. And he dashed back down the ladder. Just in, I call her my baby sister. She's actually a year and a half older than me. She had fallen off the porch and into an open five-gallon bucket of tar, feet first, <laughs> fortunately. It would have killed her. Mm -hmm. and he grabbed her by the hair of the head and raised her up out of there. Literally saved her life, you know. And he's hollering for mama, you know. She comes running out of the house. He's holding the baby and just letting it drain a little bit, you see. She's wiping her hands and looking at that. And she said, we just as well have another one as try to clean this one off. <laughs> so... That's how I came to be. <laughs> That's really good. That's a joke. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. But you know, you I, let's, <laughs> let's take this moment to talk about, um, and, and I don't want to give away the mystery of what you do, but do, is that a story that has evolved or been written each and every time you you speak it, or is it something that you sit down and you and you you write? And, I mean, can you tell me how that process happens? Yes. The movable motif that I had alluded to when we were talking about Homer just a moment ago is part of speech. If you see a film, if you see an event, if something happens in your dreams, in other words, Anything in your experience that energizes you to tell me about it, if it is indeed powerful in your life, as somebody else's story could be, it's an event in your life. When you tell it, if you are telling it from your own memory, it will change unless you have memorized it. And so it is possible to let that freedom exist. Sometimes even to alter the structure so that if it just sort of seems right at one telling to change the events a little tiny bit because of who you're talking to. Maybe it might have something to do with age of the audience. It might have something to do with your own state of mind and if someone asked me to tell a story and I was really really sad I would tell a funny story in a very different way I seem to be very very funny when I'm very very sad <laughs> so um, the the idea of what a story is when you look at folklore it can so easily be compared to the journey of life. You, you leave home. The journey of life is a leaving home story for all of us. You don't live in your parents' home, do you? No. Neither do I. And most people don't. Some people still do. But even if they do, they probably left home and came back. So the leaving home is the beginning of the story. And all of the stuff that's right there at home before you leave 
winds up getting filtered through all of the leaving homeness that occurs in our lives. What we remember that's important changes. How we want to present it changes. And I journal. I journal every day. I love it. I got addicted to it. And I, I couldn't stop if I wanted to. And occasionally I actually put down stories that I know that I tell. And hardly ever have I m remembered a text from literature to turn it into a story because I was introduced to storytelling as a fine art in this old hearth side setting. So that if I meet a great old fart who knows wonderful tales, <laughs> it is my job, if I want to tell these stories, to figure out what I can trade for it. And the only thing that I know to trade that is of any value is my genuine friendship. So I see a kindred spirit in every storyteller. And I'm willing to go back and ask for the story again until I know that I know it. And then to ask permission to tell it. So for the oral, oral tradition part of it to fit in my life, I always sort of fit, fall back and I'm identifying something for you that, that I am only able to identify by familiarity. I haven't ever, actually ever named it like this, but I know that this is an exact pattern for me. <clears throat> so, because I also write, I am keen to try to translate into my writing, when I do write stories, that which I have learned from the oral tradition. And frequently, when I, when I have uh, a story to tell, I'll say it into a tape recorder and listen back to it. And only once or twice have I written them down. And some people have a great facility with speaking. And they have an iron wall when it comes to writing. And I highly recommend this useful tool of speaking a story and making a transcription of your words and seeing how adequate you are in your understanding of how the language works so that you can see if there are missing pieces or uh, disjunctures that should not be present. And they will be so present when you are looking at your words written, what you actually said, that it can't help but make you a better speaker and consequently a better writer. Since this whole process is, I'm talking about going about it from the backwards side, speaking to writing rather than the other way around. All right, we only have about two minutes left. Oh, Shaw. Sure. Well, I have a story I have to tell you. <laughs> and then we'll go. Okay. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a great kingdom. <sighs> it is no more, sadly. <laughs> but in its day, it was the lushest of places. There were rules that had for generations allowed these people to prosper in a way that was substantially finer than all that had ever been known on the planet. And each heir, whether it was a boy or a girl, these little secret rules were passed on. And there came this one child, and this child was Brilliant, loved by all the people. It was a little boy child, or it was a little girl child. I think it was a little boy child. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this little thing grew up. All the kingdom loved this kid. And it, it was right down to the moment when they were going to be handed the kingdom. This child was just old enough, just mature enough to rule. And his parents had talked about it and they said, let's do it. And they talked once uh, back and forth. And since it was a boy, uh, the queen had decided that you, you should do it. So the king, he sits down with his son 
And he says, son, he says, very soon you are going to be king. Very soon. And you know the history of this place. You know that this is one of the rarest places on earth. He says, so I'm going to tell you something very private and very, very profound. And you must not ever forget it or all this will be lost. And he was very eager. He said, yes, Father, I am listening. I am ready. He says, son, he says, you must always remember to rule with an iron hand so that when you rule, it is true. And you must always remember to temper whatever your rule is with an absolute equal quantity of heart. And he said, son, you must always remember the third and final rule to drink from the crystal goblet from this side only. And he says, Father, I am ready. I understand absolutely all that you say with one exception. I can understand why an iron hand would be appropriate if I'm the king. And I can understand why having a kind heart as you have shown me in your life is appropriate. But why? I can't understand for the life of me. Must I always drink from this crystal goblet from this side only? And his father said, son, because if you drink from the other side, <laughs> you spill it. <laughs> That's all, folks. We'll see you next time. This is Writer's Good Night. <laughs>